My name is Miriam, and I work as a search engine optimization specialist. If you don't know what that is, we shorten it to SEO. And most of the people I talk to regularly at work call it CEO. I wish I had that salary and that title, but no luck. So my job is to play around with algorithms all day. We have different ways of playing around with them, but still a job. So let's start by setting the foundation. What is an algorithm? So when I got started writing this talk, I wanted the real definition. So I went and found a computer science book from 2009 that said this. If you have managed to read through, read through this, congratulations. I haven't, and I've given this talk many times. It's too boring for me. So let's be realistic for a second. At its core, an algorithm is a series of steps that we take to make a decision or solve a problem. If you have ever baked a cake, congratulations, you have used an algorithm. If you have managed to actually make a cake, then you have solved your problem, or at least my problem, invite me over, I'm good. So, once again, what makes up an algorithm? I just told you it's a recipe. But what makes it the right recipe? Well, first things first, it should actually end by solving the problem it was designed to solve. If it doesn't, it's false, it doesn't work. It should have very clear, unambiguous instructions. If you don't know what you are doing at each step, then you're probably putting together an Ikea bed or using the wrong algorithm. And it should be effective. It should actually solve the problem it was designed to solve. This may sound logical, but many of the algorithms we are faced with don't necessarily solve the problem they were supposed to solve. And that's why I'm here today. So bottom line, algorithms are actually good for us. We like life recipes. I do, I like to actually go on an app and click a few buttons and solve my personal problem, which is I wish to control Stephanie's skirt. I want it to be a rainbow because red or white is not good enough. I want rainbow. What does it do? It makes our lives easier. Okay, it solves problems we don't have time to think about. Good. It offers objective problem solving because as we know, human beings are not necessarily the most objective. In 2018, we have seen proof of that. And it also adds rigor to human thinking. What does it mean to be more rigorous? Well, it means that Sometimes you catch yourself making the same mistakes over and over and over again, you're like, I should know better. Well, algorithms help us as humans to have more rigor because they apply the recipe. Sometimes when we apply the recipe, we get distracted. We see something shiny. We forgot that the oven is on. So yeah, algorithms are great. And I'm just wondering why isn't everybody in love, like obsessed with algorithms going, I'm going to optimize every single side of my life so I can be lazy and just end up on the couch. Well, at least that's my ambition in life, but I have a very nice couch. So <clears throat> the first thing is that this talk is a bit scary because every time I give it, I have brand new examples. So I decided to get fancy last night because I was stressed. And I have an example from a few days ago, machine learning failures, or when algorithms go wrong. Have you seen this on Twitter yet or no? Okay, do you know what a Roomba is? Okay, great, so those things are supposed to make our lives easier or run into every single piece of furniture you own at home while pretending to clean. Well, somebody decided, I don't want my Roomba to bump into things, and then decided to get fancy with neural networks, and the bottom line was that this man basically allowed his Roomba to cheat the system. Roomba figured out that if I use the back wheels, there are no bumpers, hence I cannot bump into things. Problem solved. Oh wait, that wasn't the initial problem though, right? Yeah, careful what you wish for. So basically the Roomba gamed the system. The Roomba cheated. So what is gaming the system? Have you ever heard this expression before? Okay, it's a very popular thing in America. We talk about gaming the system for many, many things, but not necessarily computers. It's usually humans suing to get something or cheating to get something else. So gaming the system has this negative connotation that you are using 
the rules meant to protect the system in order to manipulate that system to get an outcome that was never, ever supposed to happen, aka you are bending rules that are not meant to be bent because they're meant to add rigor to suit you. So why do people like me, and probably some of you, game the system? Well, it can be for fun. As an SEO specialist, I take pride into the work that I do. I love to mess with algorithms. It's kind of a hobby. That's how I got into the job. There is no real school to do what I do. You just learn by messing with algorithms. And then you learn there's a job for that, so you do it for profit. I stand to gain when my clients are positioned well in search engine results. I stand to gain because I get paid, but companies also stand to gain when, hey, their job offers show up first on LinkedIn when people search for stuff, or their solutions show up first, or hey, on Pinterest, when you're looking for a recipe, when that recipe shows up first, there's more chances that it will keep being seen because people will keep making it and commenting on it. And then there's other reasons we do it for justice but then again we all have our own definition of what justice means so if we don't agree with the results and we want to change those results then you know we think it's a, the just thing to do the right thing to do so brief chronology before everybody thinks that this has started happening just because in 2018 certain um, countries decided to get involved in certain elections from other countries well no this has been going on forever, okay? The first algorithm that is openly talked about is more than, you know, 1,600 BC, is very, very antique. We talk about it in Babylonia, okay. And then in 1975, there is a Las Vegas conference. And it's a computer conference, of course, because they have fun then. And um, somebody coined the term gaming the system. So that became a thing, and it actually comes from the tech industry, but it's applied to everything else now. And then when you think about it, infinity, as long as humanity has existed, we've been wanting to bend the rules. Everybody wants to cheat, everybody. So here's a fun example of what happens when you mess with an algorithm. In 1999, if you typed more evil than Satan himself, in Google, you would come up with Microsoft.com as the first result. Yeah, how many of you have ever heard of the term Google Bomb? Okay, a few of you. Let me tell you, they're quite fun and they're human made. In 2005, Google Bombs got so popular because you could type in French military victories and Google would tell you, did you mean defeats? You could actually ask quite a few things. You could type idiot in 2004 and be led to the White House because George W. Bush didn't agree with a lot of things. And what really amazes me is that in 2005, that term entered the dictionary. So Merriam-Webster recognized this as a word and Google kept saying, not happening. No, it's not a thing, we are perfect. There's a reason why Google said, that it's not happening. Remember the three rules. The algorithm doesn't solve what it's supposed to solve and doesn't give adequate responses, then does it work? You can't invalidate your entire company just because somebody decided to have fun with your product. So then 2007 rolls around. So two years after this becomes an official thing recognized by human beings, Google says problem solved and they have cleaned up a lot of those problems because these Google bombs, some of them were funny, some of them not so much. So keep in mind, 2007, we have solved the problem. And then 2018 came around and said, hold my beer. Because Reddit decided to Google bomb things now. So is the problem really solved? Is the algorithm really working? Well, yes and no. These Google bombs, these, these fun things that humans do still exist. If you go on to any type of Google right now, because I tried Google.de, Google.ca, Google.com, and you type the exact thing, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And yes, that is a reference we all love. The answer will be 42, the calculator loads up. That's it. We agree that this is fun. That's why I do this. I like to see these things. Except when they're not so fun. 
So this one got removed, thankfully. But if you type, does God love everyone in Google? Well, a Christian group had hijacked the answers and basically told everybody their vision, their justice, their point of view, and imposed it on everybody else. Google is kind of a confession box, isn't it? It adds rigor, it gives answers, it's everything that we use. It's something that became a verb, but also a habit. People Google me all the time, it's a bit creepy, but now I make sure that they have the right answers instead of this. So now you understand why I'm here talking to you about this today. It worries me a lot, and it worries me a lot that every time I update this talk, I have new examples. So equal but separate. There's two notions at play here. You have working within the system, so when you work the system, it's basically all the people you hear about going, they got a scholarship, or I just was in Felix's room in track two, saying this 17-year-old is amazing, doing all these amazing things that other 17-year-olds aren't doing. Why? Because Felix is working within the system. He follows the rules, but the rules are also a bit in his favor because he's very good at what he does. So he's working the system, and he belongs in the system. We welcome him in the tech industry because he's awesome. But at the same time, there's other people that get accused of gaming the system. Gaming the system implies that you are abusing the rules. You're bending them, you're breaking them to get an outcome that was never intended. And when you get an outcome that was never intended, if you didn't study for your test, then you should not get a good grade, right? because you didn't study, you don't deserve that good grade. And if you copy on someone else, then you cheated and you still don't deserve that grade, but you're still getting it, right? Well, that's gaming the system. But gaming the system means that you also were never meant to use the system. So let's say you're actually taking the test and um, it's in the wrong language, or you don't understand, or you actually tr studied really, really hard, but hey, what your teacher didn't tell you is that they expected you to have all this knowledge from before, from your other life, because they expected all students to come from the same type of curriculum. Well, you don't get that hidden manual because there is no hidden manual. We never wanted you in the game. We're just pretending. So when I work with algorithms, I get paid, I get recognized, I get all of this, and then at the same time, there's people who think I shouldn't exist because the system should be perfect. Where do I stand? Am I working the system? Am I gaming it? Where do you stand? That's a good question. And to lighten the load up, I'd like to talk about Tinder. It's a thing I have never used. And Tinder uses a variation of the Elo algorithm. The Elo algorithm is, uh, and it's not pronounced Elo because it's actually a Hungarian person that came up with it. It's a chess algorithm. And it's used by World of Warcraft. And Tinder uses a modified version of that World of Warcraft algorithm to help people find love. So that means that you will get assigned potential matches not on your personality, not on your own merit, not on you as a person seeking to meet others, but based on the competition that day, who's around you, how do you measure up to them? Well, that's screwed up. Even I go, no, 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 I deserve love. Let me game that system. And then you realize, okay, so how do I do that? Well, a woman managed to game Tinder to get 300 matches a day. She works in marketing, oh, surprise. And she managed to market herself, but think about it. She instinctively was able to hack apart this algorithm, figuring out which variables needed to be optimized to get 300 matches a day. I'm not gonna pass judgment, because I don't know what her love life looks like, but I'm questioning, does she actually deserve 300 love matches a day? Does that mean that others are not getting love matches because she wins automatically because she's a champion? Because she also could be good at World of Warcraft then. But, you know, World of Warcraft doesn't end up in a human relationship, theoretically. So Tinder, it's a bit of a weirder game. Like, what if I'm shown just the people who are good at optimizing algorithms? Do I really want to date somebody who does that? Is that the main thing I'm seeking for a love match? Not really. So this bugs me because it points to one big thread that I keep seeing. It's that 
code discriminates, we build these algorithms and we pass on our biases in the code. We pass them on when we code. We don't even notice because that's what we do as humans. We shield ourselves quite a lot. And if we self-analyze these things, then that means A, we're more aware, but B, we have a bit more rigor than most. So we are applying a recipe that's a bit tighter. So algorithms, they're so widespread now, and they're so subtle. I mean, these little tweaks. I'm still wondering how Google Play Music chooses the top songs for each artist that it shows me, because clearly it's not my top. I didn't think it was in the top six. I don't know how it works, and it bugs me because I can't find my songs. But they are so prevalent that they function as a, as a type of social control. And if you're wondering what the heck I mean with this, well, uh, can we talk about Cambridge Analytica for a second? That's literally an algorithm that was developed to go through mundane data that I don't want to go through. I don't want to see the likes. I don't want to see the baby pictures. I don't want to see your opinions all day. I don't go on Facebook too much, but I guess I'm in the minority. A lot of people ended up being analyzed, and with a few data points, we can figure out what your fears are and act upon them. We can figure out what your political views are and act upon them, reinforce them, or, you know, shake up the foundation, just because we can. So that leads me to the idea of corrupt personalization. It's the idea that we all think that these algorithms are great, because personally, I love Google Maps. Like, I could not live without Google Maps. I got lost in Beijing without Google Maps for obvious reasons. And I couldn't make it through. I got lost in the smog. I had to ask for help, which was also complicated. Why? Because Google Maps make it so easy. When you live in Canada and it's snowing and it's minus 40, oh, please, Google Maps, tell me how fast I'm going to be able to get to work. Tell me if there's a problem. Make me more rigorous. Allow me to dedicate my time to something else, like sleeping in for an extra 15 minutes. When I said that they make our lives easier, yeah, algorithms basically allow us to offload certain things we used to do that we don't want to do anymore, and that's luxury. I don't have time to check a map every morning to make sure that I'm using the best route. Why? Because I have my mental models. I have three potential routes to get to one point because I know it well, and that's it. And I'm always going to pick the same one, even though it's probably not the best one. But in my head, it feels like it's the best one because I'm not rigorous enough. So Google Maps will tell me, hey, this one is 16 minutes more. Great. But what if Google Maps is actually tracking me everywhere I go and using that data? I don't know if you've noticed, but even if you turn off that type of tracking and you don't allow Google Maps on your Android phone, they still track you. You know how I know? Every Saturday, it keeps telling me, hey, you haven't been to the sushi place you go to every weekend yet. Do you want to go? I got freaked out. I went, oh my god, I didn't know I had these habits. So I looked at my husband and I went, we have a sushi problem. It needs to stop. So yeah, it, I, I know. I, I have a weird brain. And also, uh, sushi is under control, don't worry. But Corrupt personalization is this. Like you, you keep thinking that your life is easier with these products, and it is. But the trade-off is that maybe these products are in the product. Maybe you are the product in the end. Think about kids. Nowadays, they get into the world, and the first thing that happens is that on average, before a child turns, I think, 14, there's like something like 30,000 pictures of them online by the parents. Yeah, that's a bit scary, especially if we go back to this. So what is the algorithm going to find this time? So the most common algorithms in our lives are proprietary black boxes. And this is also a thing I updated last night. Um, I always make sure that my Google Bombs are up to date, so you're not disappointed if you actually want to try them out. And the question here, if you can't read, is, um, is Google God? And there is an answer in an answer box. So you know better, you know this is satire, but not everybody does. So that's a bit of an issue with me because I actually went to a conference um, by a very big AI company and they basically explained, trust us, trust the algorithms, we are good. And I went up to the guy and I went, yeah, you're gonna have to explain that to me. Please explain how it works. And then I went, 
I want to know where the data set comes from. I don't trust it as a human, and I'm not a mathematician. I'm not an AI specialist, but I'm worried. And the guy went, well, it's too complicated to explain to you, and our engineers are specialized, and we know best. And it's a black box. I mean, once you put it in, the machine just learns, and you can't unlearn things, and you can't figure out the way it went. Okay, you, you see the double talk here? I'm asking you what is the data point, and I'm telling you as a human that I'm worried, and your answer is, we are smarter than you, please shut up. Yeah, I still wonder about these black boxes, so now you understand why I like to play with them. So, to be is to be perceived. This is one of the first things I learned when I went to school. Like I said, I didn't go to school to become an SEO. I studied in communications, and I got stuck at 8 a.m. in the morning on Mondays with the philosophy of communication. I don't remember much, to be honest, because Monday, 8 a.m., I don't remember much, period. And this has been a lifelong thread, but I remember this. I remember that to be is to be perceived. So if you don't have visibility in the world, in some places you don't even exist. You actually have to work to prove that you do exist, that you do matter, and that you do belong. And that has been my career in tech for the past 10 years. So how do you gain visibility? Well, <laughs> I had a lot of fun reading this yesterday. The Wall Street Journal published an article, and when I searched for it, I typed in a few keywords saying, Netflix, Hollywood, that's it. And as you can see, the Wall Street Journal, one of the top stories that showed up in my feed on Google was, at Netflix, who wins when it's Hollywood versus the algorithm? I actually like the fact that nowadays, algorithms are so prevalent that there is a flip side. Algorithms also mess with our established systems instead of basically having us as humans mess with them. Now, Netflix, their algorithm is embedded in their DNA. That's how they can tell if shows are going to be good, shows are going to pay off, shows are going to be bad. And then they're hitting this problem where this institution is going, hey, by the way, it's not all about data. You don't have the right data points. So they got into a bit of a problem with Jane Fonda because Jane Fonda wanted her movie to, get, to have visibility or you know, the production company wanted that. Do you actually at Netflix say no to Jane Fonda? She's an icon. No, you can't afford to. So it doesn't matter if your math is right because Jane Fonda wins at the end of the day. Because if you say no to Jane Fonda, you say no to the production company. You say no to actors that are probably going to say no to you later on. You get a reputation for being difficult, so you don't get Hollywood's buy-in. So good luck to get more of these Marvel licensings and more of these hot actors. It's not going to happen. So at the same time, is now my question is, is Hollywood gaming the system? <laughs> or is it the opposite? Is Netflix trying to game the system? And how is that Clash of Titans going to go? Now, these are examples that are a bit terrifying and available freely every day. I want to talk about my experience a bit. This is how I play with algorithms. And these are the acceptable versions because Darfest is a very inclusive and diverse environment. So we have a few young ladies here that should not be hearing swear words or strange things you can find on Reddit at midnight. So <clears throat> I terrorize my poor husband. I terrorize him because I can, <laughs> because it's fun, because I'm good at it search engines. So back in, I think, 2010, something like that, retargeting happened. I know you know what retargeting is. It's that thing where a zombie ad follows you across everywhere. So back when it started, it wasn't as sophisticated as today. But I picked up on it because that's what I do. So I went on to one of those catalog websites. So these industries, in the, clothing, um, the clothing retail industry had catalogs, and then they realized the web is a thing, so we are going to make an e-commerce website. And as you can imagine, the products were uh, dubious at best. So I found the most hideous piece of underwear I could find. It was high-waisted, about this long, but it was also cut out in the back so your butt would hang out. And it was like canary yellow. I mean, obnoxiously yellow. So, of course, I added it to my shopping cart. And then I left. 
And then, of course, they started putting ads for this underwear everywhere, every single banner. And we even had top banners, we had side banners, we had in-content banners on an aviation website. Why an aviation website? Because my husband likes a really likes planes, and he really likes computers, and this was not my computer, of course. I didn't go shopping on my computer for ugly underwear. I went shopping on his, so for the next two weeks, every time I passed by his computer, I would just go, nice panties. And he go, it's not me, I didn't do it. I go, that's right, I know, I know, it's just, it's totally your cut. So then I terrorized him for two weeks. Yeah, don't get married to me. So. After two weeks, I noticed that he was rather distraught, so I went, no, that was me, I'm sorry, I'm messing with you. <laughs> so this is how it actually works. And he was rather mad, but now we both do this ad, so don't worry, I don't do that to other humans, I actually make sure I have a cap, etc. But this is the fun version of you getting a minus 20% advertisement when you already bought your toaster. This is what I do. And this is also what I do for a living, so don't forget, I'm behind those. So then, I decided this is not enough because I read something about people on LinkedIn optimizing their profiles. So personal um, uh, trainers would see clients by buying the premium version of LinkedIn. And with the premium version, I can actually see how much your salary range is, how much your salary range is. So it's easier to pick clients, right? We pick the rich ones. So then I went, wait. If that guy in New York in his tiny shorts doing this or this on LinkedIn can find people and optimize like this, I want to optimize. So I optimized my LinkedIn like a maniac. I figured out exactly how to optimize it. So if you want to revamp your CV, listen close. Your title matters, okay. Then your skills, you need to get people to actually you know, vote for your skills. But the problem with the skills is that people are lazy and used to vote just for the top three. Now. Thanks to machine learning, LinkedIn is encouraging you to vote for more stuff. But back then, it wasn't that case. So I cheated and put the top three that I wanted. And then I social engineered writing people and asking, could you please validate me for this? Because I worked with Google Analytics and I had a colleague who specialized in that. And I ended up with something like 100 or 150 people liking this skill of mine and he was super mad going, this is my specialty, why are you doing this? I'm like, A, to piss you off, and B, we're gonna have some fun. So then I optimized his. And then I optimized the third persons because we were all in marketing but doing specific things. So if you work with JavaScript and you get recruiter emails going, I really need to, to hire somebody who does Java, you're like, ugh. Well, imagine what it's like when you do search engine optimization and people are like, you would be great to help me track people or to do emails. And I'm like, how do I explain marketing to them? So then we ended up being hit up for the same jobs. I checked, and the reason why is that we were showing up top three every time a recruiter searched for any type of skill that I had optimized for, including UX and JavaScript. Thank you very much. I get offers to this day. I still don't know how to do JavaScript properly, but I still get jobs. So if you don't, come and talk to me. Uh, and then we were playing with the recruiters. We were doing this recruiter torture where we would send them to each other <laughs> and then reinforce the whole system. Yes, I'm not a very nice person, but it was really fun to see how recruiters think. And the way they think is by typing a few keywords in the search bar and going. So that's my game, my specialty, let's go. And then um, I slowly taught someone's YouTube account that um, this person enjoyed um, Nickelback and some romantic death metal grind chord, that's how it was defined, on YouTube. I messed with their algorithmic recommendations based on their history. And when I say a person, once again, you can probably guess it was my poor husband because I like my friends and they're not married to me, so they're not stuck. So I would write this email going, it's super important, you have to fill out this PDF for the accountant, otherwise we will have a problem with our taxes. And it wasn't, it was a YouTube video. <laughs> it was a YouTube video of a band produced by Nickelback with a rapper in the middle called Ludacris doing a little I don't know, song and dance. And then they had ladies everywhere and it was just awful and it sounded bad, but now YouTube thought that my husband loved everything that was Nickelback and Nickelback related and Nickelback produced. And then I went a bit more hardcore because we do terrorize each other. He did the same thing to me, but with Madonna and La Isla Bonita. I don't know if you know this, but now I just get Madonna recommendations and it's been years. So, but at least Madonna's better than what I had. I, I, I went with Finnish grindcore, what was it? 
death metal, and yeah, they said it was romantic too, and I was like, <laughs> we are going with this. If you've ever heard La Macarena sung by a death metal band from Colombia in a disaffected swimming pool, then maybe you should talk to my husband's YouTube history, because you will love it. He still does not to this day understand that he can turn it off. I am still enjoying myself. So if you've gotten any ideas, or if you've done this before, come and talk to me after, because I think we're going to have fun. So thank you very much for listening to me. And my name is Miriam. If you need any help, my rule is if it takes me 15 minutes to answer you, that's fine. If you're asking me to actually help mess with an algorithm that will take me probably two weeks or more, I start charging, sadly, because it's a job, not a hobby. Well, it is a hobby, but I already have a partner for that. So thank you very much. And um, don't hesitate to ask me questions. Thank you, Miriam. So who has a question? There's one. Yes. If you need advice on Pinterest, I also do that too. It shows me dead rockers now. So I understand on many of these algorithms, they work on reinforcement. How are you able to like, target them easily or like with one link or one message? I mean, they usually take more um, oh, absolutely. steps. <laughs> absolutely. So what usually happens is that there's multiple steps, right? So for example, on LinkedIn, when I optimized, I figured out what were the key elements. And that's what the woman with Tinder did. She, she figured out that the profile picture is super important. She figured out that the location is important. She figured out that you need to cheat on the age if you do not get enough matches because during that day, maybe people are younger and blah, blah, blah. That's how my friend got matched with a 21-year-old. Uh, she's 40. She got very confused because he had lied. <laughs> so for me personally, the way I optimize things is that I, f I try to figure out the elements it takes into account. And you can't cheat the system by optimizing everything in a single day. You have to do step by step by step. So this is an iterative process where you basically calibrate and teach the machine what you want. And for example, when it comes to what Reddit did, uh, let me find it again, the Reddit thing. This worked because of the sheer amount of human beings that decided. They literally set up to game the system together. They were working together, changing bits by bits by bits. So when there's so much input coming in, then it's very hard for Google, let's say, to figure something out. A clear example for you would be if you Google Swiss military, you will not see a single human being in Google search, like Google search for images. It's just watches, 10 scrolls of watches before you find one military picture. And it's to talk about the problems with Swiss Army knife chocolates. That's how badly you can game an algorithm if you put enough input, time. It's kind of like a dog, you train it. I'm not going to say that out loud, but congratulations, Parenting 101. It, does that answer your question or not at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. No, oh. For example, in, in Google, when I explain to people what I do, I explain that there's three pillars to doing this. You have to have good content, you have to have good code, because if the bot doesn't see your content, because you know it doesn't understand the code, it can't actually access the stuff, then you're stuck. But everybody always says they're the best in their content. How many of you have companies that have like all these marketing words in the homepage and you have no clue what they do actually? Yeah. So what you need is links. You need reputation reinforcement from other websites. So now you see how it plays also with Reddit. Like if people have this input and then there are links and there's content and there's feedback and it's well made, boom, it goes up. Like we, we know there's 200 factors, but those are the three big pillars. Like we figure them out. Any other questions? Because I don't see any of you really. I'm just pretending. <laughs> no? OK, well, perfect then. Thank you very much for staying here. <laughs> <laughs>